Bibles, if you would please, this morning to the book of Matthew, chapter 13. Matthew, chapter 13. Yeah, praise God. Brother Mark, could you give me a little more juice on that microphone, if you don't mind? Thank you, Father. I'm excited about what the Lord has put on my heart to share with you today. I asked the Lord, I said, now, Father, I'm... I, I'm stirred up about it. As of yesterday, I was stirred up about it. But I said, am I stirred up about it because it's my word? <laughs> You're talking to me. Or is it for the congregation? And uh, I just had peace about sharing with you what I'm stirred up about. Glory to God. I've, I've sort of been on a theme. I've been talking about the love of God. And then, of course, we uh, have been talking about how that relates to our faith. God wants us to walk in the blessing. Spent a lot of time in 2017 talking to you about the blessing of the Lord. Proverbs 10, says, the blessing of the Lord, it makes one rich. Amen. Notice that blessing makes one. Amen. See, it will do something to your life. Amen. And what is it? It is the blessing, not of the world. It's not the blessing of your corporation. It's not the blessing of your education. It's not the blessing of hard work. It's not the blessing of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. It's called the blessing of the Lord. In other words, the Lord empowers you in every arena of your life for things to go good, for things to go well. I tra- oh man, oh that turned out good. Thank you, Father. The blessing of the Lord will make you rich, that verse says. And my favorite part of it is how that verse ends. And he will add no sorrow with it. There's no sorrow attached to the blessing of the Lord. In in the world, it's a shell game. A lot of times I have to sacrifice this arena of my life to to progress over here. I I have to tear up my marriage or neglect my spouse and children to go after a career. Right? Or I have to give up money to, to, you know, to be faithful to my local church because of how busy we are. No. No. God will bless every arena of your life all at the same time. There won't be any sorrow attached to His blessing. And listen, the great thing about it is we don't have to work for that blessing. You cannot earn it. It is a gift. The blessing of the Lord is a gift. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 3, That Christ himself redeemed us from the curse of the law. Why? That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus. And that we also might receive the promise of the Holy Ghost, the Spirit, by faith. Hallelujah. It's a gift. We receive it when we come into the new birth. We become a child of God and that blessing is on us. Hallelujah. Now, yes, we can mess it up. We could short-circuit it. We could not cooperate with it. But you cannot earn it. It's a gift. We just receive it. We just walk in it by faith. We learn how to cooperate with it. And uh, so here in Matthew chapter 13, we're going to deal today, maybe tomorrow, uh, maybe ne- not tomorrow, next week, seeing how, how far we get today, about... Uh, overcoming a great hindrance to our faith from working. The blessing of God operates by faith. All the blessings of God come into our life, how? By faith. We're saved, how? By grace, through faith. That not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So if we receive the greatest, the greatest miracle we'll ever receive is being born again. Becoming a new species of being, a new creature in Christ. That's the greatest miracle. The highest thing you'll ever have happen to you in your life is getting born again. If that, is, if that blessing is entered into by faith, how many of you know every other thing would be a lesser thing? It's going to be received the same way. By faith. How are you going to be healed? By faith. How are you going to be filled with the Holy Ghost? By faith. How are you going to walk in divine protection? By faith. How are you going to walk in divine peace? By faith. How are you going to walk in the love of God? 
By faith. Amen. And so let's look at an instance here in uh, Matthew chapter 13. And uh, we're going to look at verse 58. And this is uh, obviously the last verse in this chapter. And it is a verse describing a tragic day in the ministry of Jesus on planet earth in which other people shut his ministry down. How many know we don't want to shut the ministry of Jesus down? We don't want to hinder him from operating. But do you know we can? You know Jesus, he cannot just, if he manifests himself, walked in the back, he could not do anything he wanted to do in that service just because he's Jesus. He's the same Jesus back then, he couldn't do it. Let's look at verse number 58. Let's read verse 57 and 58. It says, And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save or except in his own country and in his own house. You understand what he's saying? He's saying a prophet or a minister is going to be honored as a prophet, as a minister, in every place except where he comes from. Where people knew him. Where people grew up watching him. Because they will be familiar with him. They won't have the honor and the respect uh, for him that they could, but they typically won't and don't. And then it says in verse 58, it says, And he did not many mighty works there. Now how come? Because of their unbelief. What hindered Jesus in Nazareth from doing mighty works? Unbelief. I wonder what would hinder Jesus today from doing mighty works? Same thing. It'd have to be unbelief. And I wonder if humans today, 2,000 some years later, from this event here, or if we're much different. I'm going to make a statement I heard a preacher make, and uh, I'm going to make this statement and repeat him, and I hope it lands on you like it landed on me. You know, unbelief is, he, he said, unbelief is probably the worst thing that could ever happen to a person. Unbelief be about the worst condition you could ever find yourself in. That's a big statement. It's a big statement. Unbelief would be the worst thing that could ever happen to you. Well, let's think about that for a moment. Why do people go to hell? One reason. They only go to hell for one reason. Unbelief. They don't go to hell because of what they did wrong. We don't go to heaven because of what we did right. We go to heaven for one reason. What is that? Belief. We go to heaven because we believe. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe that He's God's Son. We believe, don't we? That He went to the cross for us. He paid our sin debt. That He died on that cross and that three days later God raised Him from the dead. We believe. That's the only reason why we're going to heaven and not hell. There's only one reason why someone will go to hell. It's not because they committed a crime. It's not because they were evil. We were all evil. We all committed crimes. We were all sinners. People go to hell. That'd be the worst thing that could ever happen to a person, right? Be to die and go to hell? It only happens for one reason. Unbelief. So, see, how dangerous then must unbelief be? Can God just save everybody? No, He can. Doesn't He want to? He wants to. Don't we know that that's His, is it His will that any person perish? Any person die and go to hell? Isn't He God? Isn't He all sovereign being? Isn't He the Creator? And yet he can't, he can't save the sinner? Not if 
They don't believe. You understand that? The Bible says that God wills that all men be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. But we read it this morning in our Connect class. In Mark 16, the Great Commission, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe will be damned to hell. I can't think of a worse thing to happen to a person than for them to die and go to hell. So see, unbelief is a dangerous thing. And it's an awful thing. Now if it's unbelief that would keep a person, that would keep God away, unable from doing what humans need God to do for them most to save them, why can't God intervene for us in other areas? It'd be the, it'd be the primary reason. It would be unbelief. Why are more not healed? Why, why can't God heal them? It says, it didn't say He didn't want to. It says He could there. Could there do no mighty work? How come? Because of, I'm going to go real slow. Because of their unbelief. People are not, not healed today because God is holding out. Because God isn't healing anymore. That's not why. It's not a, la it's not a change in His will. It's not a change in His plan. He's not teaching them anything through it. It's His will that they be healed and made whole now. How come he can't do that now? Because of unbelief. Why aren't we seeing more of this promised revival? Because of unbelief. Why aren't, let's break it down, let's start talking about others. Why aren't you and I experiencing more of God's miracle working power in our life? Why is God not able to get in there and rescue you more and faster and to greater degree? Could it be? Could, could you be humble enough? Could I be humble enough to say and to recognize that it's possible that I have some unbelief at work in me? Come on. Could it be that doubt is robbing me in areas of my life of measures of God's blessing. Come on. It's, it's right. And so I, I want us to look at this issue of unbelief. Right? Go over with me to Matthew 17. Y'all going to help me preach this this morning? Matthew 17. Glory, glory, glory. You know, I, I really think and know that in this age today that we've become too buddy-buddy with doubt. We tolerate doubt in our life. We know we doubt. We know we do in areas. And we, we, uh, we think of it a lot like people think about sin. Well, we all got to sin. Everybody sins. We have to. Hey, no, we don't have to. If we had to sin, God would be unjust to judge you for having, right? It'd be wrong for God to judge a dog for barking. Wouldn't that be bad? Right? Some of you, you men, you've done it. You kicked your dog for barking. You yelled and screamed at your dog, so have I for barking. But it's the dog's nature to bark. Hello. 
Listen, as a born-again believer, it is not your nature anymore to sin. You are not a sinner anymore. Now, religion will tell you that. I've heard, I've heard people say things to the effect preachers. Well, there's really not much of a difference between a Christian and a sinner. We're just forgiven. That's not true. That's not Bible. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. One, my favorite translation says, a new species of being that never existed before. You're brand new on the inside because the Holy Ghost came in and eternal life was imparted and the righteousness of Jesus was imputed, dealt, added like an ingredient to your spirit. And you are today, 2 Corinthians 5.21, been made the righteousness of God in Christ. It is not our nature to sin. It's the flesh's nature still to sin. And the unrenewed mind doesn't cooperate. But see, from the moment you and I were born again, my spirit always wanted to do right. Always wanted to do right. Always do the right thing. Always go the right way. I have to override my heart to sin. And so do you if you're saved. Amen. And uh, so praise God. Uh, it's not our, so therefore, it's not our nature to doubt. Therefore, it's not okay to doubt. You shouldn't excuse it. Well, I doubted, you know, little me, bless my darling heart. No, listen, before we leave today, I pray you're going to see the way God views doubt. I'll just pull the rabbit out of the hat real quick. He called it evil. Now we know that guy that went in and shot up that church, that was evil. That guy that went and shot up that crowd over in Las Vegas, that was evil. You know peddling dope, that's evil. Committing adult, that, that's evil. Sexual sin, that's evil. But you know what doubting God is evil. And I don't care what the church thinks about it, what we think about it. If God said it's evil, we ought to not, we ought to not want any, we ought to, we'd want to touch it. I wouldn't want to, I'm far away from robbing a bank. That'd be evil. I don't, I'm not into that. Racism, that's evil. Bigotry, that's evil. Hatred, that's evil. Doubting God is evil. And listen, you know what? God hates it. He hates it when we doubt Him. I don't know, I got to thinking about this and studying it yesterday, and I just thought, oh my God, Father, I'm being reminded about how dangerous unbelief is. Listen, I want God in our services, how about you, to be able to come in and do mighty works. Right? You know, he's not able in very many churches to do mighty works. Why? Unbelief. 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 They're not believing nothing. They doubt. They doubt God will. They doubt God's able. They doubt. Maybe they don't doubt he's able, but they sure doubt his willingness. And I want to ex people to come in here and get delivered and stand up out. Of, I, I'd like to just decorate all these tan walls with apparatus with canes and walkers and wheelchairs and all kinds of apparatus and apnea machines and all of that. So let's just decorate it up with stuff people got delivered from. I want to see God do mighty works of power in our midst. It's going to be a mighty work of power when he pays this building off. Glory to God. It's going to be a mighty work of power when he uh, pays my house off and my cars off and brings my farm equipment in. It's going to take power to do it. It's going to take power to break demonic strongholds off of the addicted and all the people and all the darkness that are out there and they're going to start coming in here and they're messed up and messed up in their mind and messed up in their body and God is going to set them free and deliver. But it's going to take power to do it. 
power. And God needs our faith to do it. In Matthew 17, in verse number uh, 20, well, let's read verse 18 down to 20. And Jesus rebuked the demon or the devil, and he departed out of the boy, out of the man. And the child was cured from that very hour. Notice Jesus got the result that the disciples could not get. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, why? Oh, a lot of Christians asking why. I prayed, Father, why? I tithe, Father, why? I sow offerings, Father, why? <laughs> I tried that, why? Why, they asked, could we not cast him out? Jesus said unto them, bless your darling heart because you're not me. No. No. He said, because of your unbelief. Why couldn't the disciples get the result Jesus got? Because they doubted when, faith, when Jesus stayed in faith. Hallelujah. Now notice what Jesus goes on and teaches them. For verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall be removed, and nothing shall be impossible to you. What is Jesus saying to them here? He is saying it is not the smallness of your faith that caused you to be unable to get that demon out of that boy. Notice what he said. He said, even if you have faith as of the size of a mustard seed. How, how, the small seed. Smallest of seeds. Right? He said, if you've got faith that size, you shall speak unto this mountain. And it shall be removed and nothing shall be impossible unto you. See, people will say, un, uh, ignorantly, I'm sure, unknowingly, I'm sure, I just don't have enough faith. That's not true. That's not true. You have faith. You have the faith of God. The Bible says you do. In Romans 12, verse 3, it says, don't compare yourself among the number. That's not wise, right? Right? It goes on and says, For God has dealt to every man, every person, the measure of faith. Amen. Romans 12, 3. You have a measure of the God kind of faith. Mark 11, verse 22. Jesus said, Have the God kind of faith. Well, wouldn't that be stupid to, for Him to say, Have the God kind of faith if I couldn't have it? Listen, it's not a matter of your small faith that's keeping things from happening in your life. What's the, the problem is you've added something. Something has entered in. You have mixed something in to your faith called doubt, called unbelief. And the moment you add unbelief to the equation, it all falls apart. It undoes, it, it undoes the operation of your faith. Are you with me? You understand that? So the key is, yes, sure, become more skillful with your faith. Develop your faith. But the great danger, the thing to really focus on is keep my faith pure. It's my job to keep doubt out. To keep my faith undiluted and uncontaminated, I've got to be without a doubt. I cannot have doubt. If there's doubt, my faith won't operate. My faith has been poisoned. My faith has been rendered inactive. But the moment you take doubt, the moment you get unbelief out of the equation, you got it. Your faith will move mountains. Are you with me? 
Jesus said, the reason, guys, that you didn't get the result I got is because you doubted. Are you with me? Go over with me to the book of Hebrews, chapter 3. Hallelujah. Oh, that dirty, rotten unbelief. I'm ashamed to say I've recognized it in me in some areas. How about yourself? I can look back on prayers that I've prayed. Look back in my journal and, and I wrote down the day in the, where I released my faith. And I stood and I stood and I stood. And then pressure came. Pressure came. And I, I, can, re- I can recollect, I can remember... Maybe, maybe the report came. Maybe Amber gave me a report on church finances or something. And negativity came. And I, let, I got negative. You ever, listen, when you get negative, doubt came in. That's how you know. How do I know that I'm operating in unbelief instead of faith? When you're negative. When you're negative about it. When you're not positive. You're in doubt. You're in unbelief. Amen. And that'd be, that would be the moment I could identify, tracing that thing, why it hadn't corrected itself. And it won't until I get the doubt out. And it won't for you. Your miracle's not coming until you get the doubt out. Until you deal with the unbelief. Are you with me? Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 3. Actually, let's not do that. Keep keep your hand there, but flip back over to 1 Corinthians. Uh, Yeah, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We'll go to Hebrews 3 in a moment. Y'all all right? This this will help us. Praise you. I want things to work in my life. And one thing I will say, I'm big enough, I'm not out blaming God. I know God's not my problem. I'm smart enough to know that. God's not my problem. Amen. And you know, you, you're tempted, I think we all might be, to look around, okay, God's not my problem, other people are my problem. If other people would get it straight, well, there may be an element of truth to that. But other people, it's not what's keeping your miracle from coming to pass. It's me. It's me. Look at what Paul said here in verse number 1 of 1 Corinthians 10. He says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant or or unknowing, uninformed, right? Right? How that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. All were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Who's he talking about, our fathers? He's talking about the Jews. He's talking about Israel, isn't he? Mm -hmm. That all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And all did eat the same spiritual meat and all did drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. Now, we know that there's something that pleases God. What's that? Faith pleases God. What's that tell us about these folks? They must not have been operating in faith. Because God was not pleased with them. I want God to be pleased with me. With many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Listen, I was thinking about this last night. It does not please the Father when Chris gets overthrown by a circumstance. It does not please God when Chris gets overthrown in a battle. When He made me a conqueror, and He made me an overcomer, 
And he gave me the name and the blood and the Holy Ghost and the Word of God and angels and the power of God and a covenant with the Father and the faith that moves mountains. And I get overthrown? That doesn't please the Father. It doesn't please me when I see Rex struggle in a jiu-jitsu match that I know he should win. Are you with me? Hallelujah. And it doesn't please God when you lose a battle. When we get overthrown. Now notice verse 6. Let's take, take this to heart. Now these things were what? They were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also after, lusted after. Skip down to verse 11. Now all these things happen unto them for in samples or examples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore let him that thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. There has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man, but God is faithful. You believe that? Yes. Who will not suffer or allow you to be tempted or tried above what you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So what is he saying? He's saying here that all the things that happened to that generation that God brought out of Egypt are an example for us today. Mm -hmm. That they were overthrown in the wilderness and that did not please God. And we know that they did not enter in to the promised land. Right. That generation died in the wilderness. Why? It says they died in the wilderness because they tempted God. How could you tempt God? Well, they did. They tempted God over and over and over and over again until finally he had enough. He's been hearing them say, how are we going to make it? How are we going to make it? He, he'd been hearing them say, after all that he did for them, after they watched the ten plagues and all the miracles, after he watched God part the Red Sea and how they passed through the Red Sea on dry ground, he watched how they came out of Egypt loaded down with silver and gold, healed and none feeble among them. After they watched God feed their flocks and water their flocks with water out of a rock, they would say over and over and over again, Can God, can God provide a table in the wilderness? Can God provide meat in the wilderness? Can God give us water to drink? Oh, if we could go only go back to Egypt. Oh, why did you bring us out here, Moses, only to die? Over and over and over again, they said stuff like that in God's hearing. And finally, God said, fine then. You've got faith to die. You've got death in your mouth. And death you will. Die you will. You're going to have exactly what you said because you won't believe me. And they did not enter in because of unbelief. Now go over to Hebrews chapter 3. Now, why did he tell them this? Why did Paul say, what did Paul say about their... Ex he said, better watch them. You better take the lesson about what happened to them. How come they didn't enter in? Because they didn't believe. They didn't take them in because God, wasn't, because God failed them. They didn't go into the promised land. They didn't fail to go into the promised land because God got mad. He was mad. But that's not why. He, he didn't get mad because he ran out of miracle working power. He got mad. He got, they, they failed to enter in because they didn't believe him. Hallelujah. What's keeping you and I from entering in to what God has for us? Yeah. All right, let's read chapter 3 and verse number 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you will hear his voice and harden not your heart, as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me and proved me. Notice, they put God to the test. 
They, te- they, they tested him. And saw my works 40 years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, They shall not enter my rest. You know, rest is healing, rest is getting your bills paid, rest is being divinely protected, rest is joy, rest is peace. Now, notice what he tells us in verse 12. Take heed, brethren. Your translation say something different? Beware. Hey, when the Bible says, beware, that's like saying, whoa. When the Bible uses the word, woe, W-O-E, you don't want to be anywhere near woe. Like the woes of Revelation. The first woe is past and the second woe is sent. You don't want to be near a woe. He says, take heed, brethren. Beware, brethren. Lest what? There be in any of you, now notice what he calls it, an evil heart of unbelief. An evil heart of unbelief. Now notice what unbelief causes you to do. To depart from the living God. But exhort or encourage one another daily while it is called today lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said today, if you will hear His voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, they did provoke. They provoke. Can you provoke God? They did. Howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses... But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear they that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that they believe not? So the sum of all of it is what? Verse 19. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Verse 1, you know this all goes together, right? Chapter 4 just rolls right in, same letter. Let us therefore what? Fear. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into His rest, any of us would seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So, see, to sum up, they didn't enter into the promised land because of unbelief. He's telling us, take the note, take heed, beware, lest there be a promise out there for you. See, there's a promise out there for us of entering into the fullness of His rest. And what would keep us out? The same thing that kept them out is unbelief. Let me close today with a, a thought or two here. In the, so far in my study on unbelief, I can find two kinds of unbelief. Over in, we're not going to go there, but in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13, Paul is talking to his spiritual son Timothy, and he talks about all the things that he did as a sinner before he came to know Jesus. How he was a chief sinner, how he uh, persecuted the church. He did horrible things. But it says he did it ignorantly in unbelief. So there, there's the first kind of unbelief, which is unbelief because you just don't know. Why do some people not, not believe? Why aren't they believing to be healed? That, they just don't know that they could. They don't know they should. They're not sure healing is even available. So it's not that they're being antagonistic they just don't know right and that's the it's still bad it's still wrong it'll still keep you out but it's better than the other kind of unbelief this kind of unbelief right here in chapter 3 verse number 12 take peace brethren uh, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief it's a different Greek word than is used over there in Timothy 
Uh, the word in Timothy, where Paul uses the word unbelief about ignorant unbelief, is the Greek word apistos. Pistos is the Greek word which means faith or trust. Apistos means lack of. It's just faithless. It just simply means lack of faith. No faith. Why? Because they don't know. They just don't know. This word is a different Greek word. This Greek word means to be in a condition of unpersuadableness or refusing to be persuaded. And this is the kind of sin that Israel got in. They didn't commit unbelief in the wilderness because they didn't know. They saw God up on that mountain. They heard His voice with their ears. They saw His mighty works done in Egypt. They ate manna off the ground every morning and every night. Hello? Or at least once a day. Right? They drank the water that came out of the rock. They saw His works. It's not like they didn't see nothing. It's not like they'd never heard. But when pressure came, and when the answer didn't manifest right away, they went to groaning. They went to griping. They went to whining. This is all stuff. What, how do we know if we're in unbelief? If we're groaning. If we're whining. If we're griping. If we're complaining. If we're asking questions. It's a sure sign. That's what unbelief looks like. That's what unbelief sounds like. And God's not up there going from heaven. Look at all those poor little humans down there. Bless their darling hearts. They're just so weak and feeble. No, he got mad about it. See, there, some Christians, they just don't know. Right? And you preach the word to them, and they'll know. And many of them will believe. But there's a lot of us today, even in the Word of Faith movement, we've heard it and heard it and heard it. And they'll say, I, you know, it's, I'll tell you, and I'm closing here. One of the most frustrating things for me the last two years doing what I do as a minister has been counseling. I used to like it. I'm sour on it right now if you want counseling. I'll just know I'm in a bad mood about it. I used to be fulfilled in it. I'm just being honest with you. It's not that I don't love I'm not sour on people. I'm not down on pastoring. I'm down on counseling. You want to know why? They don't listen to me. They don't listen to me. They don't want me to read the Bible to them. They want some psychological, emotional... And I'm having a hard time doing that. Because I know that's not what you need, baby. And I know the Bible says weep with those who... But you're going to have to stop crying. You've been crying. That's not solving it. You've been dopey and down and moody. That's not fixing it. And I know your problems are real. But if you won't take heed to the Word, I cannot help you. If you want a psychologist, go hire one. If you want a therapist, you're not going to hurt my feelings. Go get one. If you want someone to... And I'm not, I'm not ungentle. But if you're going to come to me for counsel, I'm going to give you the Word. People don't want the Word. You want to know why? They, they won't be persuaded. I, I've tried. I, I, I have done things in the last two years. Some, some counseling sessions have been successful. Some, some things we could... I'm not going to tell you because of confidentiality, but... There's things, the last couple of years, we could celebrate. Thank God. But I tell you what, I have, I have had times where people asked time with me, and I, I got up, and I came to the office, and I prayed, and I meditated on the Scripture, and I shut other things out, and they came into the office, and I gave them a word, and I gave them the Bible, and I gave them what the Bible says about their answer, and they look like you slapped them with a wet dish rag. Yeah, come on. And they say stuff, I know that it says that but you're not doing it. You're not doing it. And you're poking the bear. I've 
actually thought about calling my board and saying, do I have to? <laughs> pastor Nancy, Dr. Jake, do I have to? Do I have to counsel? Because I'm a pastor, do I have to? Does that just go with the, where in the word? Do I have to? Can't I just get up and feed them and pray for them? Because they don't listen. They won't listen to me. I hadn't made that phone call yet. I'm just telling you, it's, frust- it's got to be frustrating for the Lord. Amen. That's what keeps me going. Because I'll go, Father, how much have you put up with in me? Oh, dear Jesus. You have just put up with so much in all of us. Right? And I tell you, most of us in this church, as I'm closing, God has done some stuff for you. You have seen Him move in your life. You have seen Him work. Right? You've seen Him turn situations around. Just like they did back then. Don't ever let yourself get to where where you won't be persuaded. Can we close on just one more scripture? It'll be a high note. I don't want to leave you on a low note. Let's go over to Romans chapter 4. I want to leave you on a high note. But I think we're going to have to come back and just do some more digging around about this doubt and unbelief. It's like Brother Scott was saying in the back room. He said, you know, people say, I'm believing, but... No, you're not. You just... You know, I don't even know what's about to come after, but it's like, I've, it's like I tell people, that's your problems, your big butt. <laughs> if you'd have just stopped, I'm believing God, and just stopped, you'd have been in faith. But you went on with your little tale of woe. Your little tale, what Dr. Jacobs calls your little tale of woe. All your sadness, and all your disappointments, and all your questionings and how hard it is and just totally undid you're not believing don't tell me don't believe let's at least not be deceived you are doubting God and he hates that because he's not worthy of being doubted there's no reason for us to doubt him is there God help me forgive me for ever doubting the word ever doubt. See, you could be around the Word so much, it's like that. We, be, we become like those people in Nazareth. So familiar that we're not persuaded by the Word anymore. How'd you get that? You hardened your heart. The Word of God is a living thing. It's quick. It's powerful. Sharper than any two-edged sword. Romans chapter 4. Let's look at something great here real quick and then we'll We'll go home, praise God, or whatever we're going to do next. Uh, Romans chapter 4. And uh, let's see, I'm looking for my my friend Abraham here. Praise God. Look at verse 2. For if Abraham were justified by works, he has thereof to glory, but not before God. For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God. And no more. There's not a but. Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Amen. Now skipping all the way down to verse 19. Speaking more about Abraham. It says, And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither the deadness of Sarah's womb. Verse 20. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. He didn't do it. He didn't do it. He didn't trip over unbelief. But he was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Now notice this. Being fully persuaded. That's what made him strong in faith. He allowed the Word of God to totally and utterly convince him that it didn't matter how long it had been, how many years had gone by, how old his body was, how old and wrinkly his wife was, 
He was so convinced that because God said you're going to have a son on that basis alone, bless God, I believe God, I'm going to have a son. Glory to God. Glory to God. That's all he did. He just believed God. He didn't stumble like so many, like I have done. I'm not going. I'm, I'm going to stop doing. It. I don't know what you're going to do. I'm going to stop doing. It. Have you ever had certain tests that the Lord's got you on, and you got to just go around and around and around and around and around because you keep tripping over the same around and don't you get tired of that same scenery? Same rigmarole, same thing. Going around the same mountain, having to look at the same giant, you're going to until you slay that thing. Stop letting pressure, stop letting emotions push you out of faith and make you negative and get you to question it. We're going to be like Father Abraham. We're going to let the Word of God and the promise of God and the Holy Ghost voice in us totally, utterly convince us by His stripes, I am well. No but. That's the way it is. We're going to let God totally convince us that He is able to supply all of our needs according to His riches and glory. Don't care how bad it gets. Don't care how bad it looks. Don't care how long it's been that way. I'm not going to stumble and get negative. I'm just going to stand in there and believe God. That it will be unto me even as He told me. I'm not going to get negative about my backslidden children, not another day. I believe God that He is working on my family. He's working on those children. He's going to turn their heart. They're not going to die. They're not going to go to hell. They're not going to uh, have an overdose. They're not going to commit suicide. They're not going to jail. They're going to serve God with all their heart. God is, I'm not going to doubt. I'm not going to lay here and worry. I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to be negative. I'm going to believe God. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I, I just believe everything God has said to me, it is going to come to pass. It is going to come to pass. It is going to come to pass. Everything God has for me, it's going to come to pass. Everything God has for you, Mom, is going to come to pass. Your car paid off, your house, your money, your income, the miracles, the dreams, all of it. You believe God, you're healed, you're healed, you're healed. You're not sick. You're not broken. It is unto you exactly the way God said. Amen. He's bringing a total and utter end to all that sickness. Amen. I believe it. Yeah. No but. God's going to fill every seat, every parking space. We're going to have them parked on the grass. They're going to have to put a stoplight out there. Come on. Come on. Jennifer, your girls are going to serve God. They're going to serve God. They're going to be bright and shining lights for Jesus. They're going to make the devil pay. They're going to make the devil wish that they had never done that to them. Prophetesses and anointed girls. Hallelujah. All of it. Your husband, ladies, is going to be the priest of his house. He's going to wear out his jeans praying on his... I'm telling you what, he's going to be sweet. He's going to be your lover. He's going to be your best friend. He's going to kill the bacon and bring it home. God is going to move in his life. Come on, we're just going to believe God. I just believe God. We're going to go into the financial office tomorrow and we're going to believe God. Amen. God's right. able to turn this thing around for us. Hallelujah.
Glory to God. God's able to bring bread a wife. A pretty one. Yeah, that's right. A Holy Ghost girl. That's right. Amen. Amen. One that wants to live in Paducah. Is that right? That's right. That's right. All you ladies, God, come on, just believe God. He'll raise some man up from the dead. I mean, he'll bring him to, he'll wash him up, clean him up, fill him with the Holy Ghost. Just for you. Give him a good job. They'll fall in love with your pastor just like you love your pastor. Telling you what, I'm mad about it. Praise God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Let's just lift our hands.